Good evening once again from our NBC News headquarters in New York. I'm Ali Velshi in for Brian Williams, who's under the weather tonight. He's hoping to return to the lineup soon. It is day 1021 of the Trump administration. The president is back on the campaign trail in Louisiana tonight, one night after bruising election results for Republicans and hours after House Democrats announced the impeachment effort is about to go public. Open hearings get underway exactly one week from today. Tonight, in the state he twice called Louisiana, Trump again lashed out at the Democrats. Democrats are becoming increasingly totalitarian, suppressing dissent, defaming the innocent, eliminating due process, staging show trials, and trying to overthrow American democracy to impose their socialist agenda. All right, tonight, the Washington Post is reporting that Trump wanted Attorney General William Barr to hold a news conference declaring that he had broken no laws during his phone call with the president of Ukraine. But Barr declined to do so. The Post says, quote, the request from Trump traveled from the president to other White House officials and eventually to the Justice Department. The president has mentioned Barr's declination to associates in recent weeks, saying he wished Barr would have held the news conference, Trump advisors say. That request came sometime around September 25th, when the administration released a rough transcript of the president's July phone call. The paper says the Justice Department had tried to distance itself from the controversy surrounding Trump's dealings with Ukraine. Next week, lawmakers will begin televised hearings with questions for State Department official George Kent, the current acting ambassador to Ukraine, William Taylor, and the former American ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch. Today, House Intelligence Committee Chair Adam Schiff said that questioning will go a long way toward building the case against the president. You will see um, throughout the course of the testimony, not only their testimony, but many others, um, the uh, most important facts are largely not contested. Uh, we are getting an increasing appreciation for just what took place uh, during the course of the last year uh, and the degree to which the president uh, enlisted whole departments of government in the illicit aim of trying to get Ukraine to uh, dig up dirt on a political opponent, uh, as well as further conspiracy theory about the 2016 election. Today, we got something of a preview of what to expect from Bill Taylor's public testimony with the release of his closed door transcript from October 22nd. The Vietnam War veteran and career diplomat who has served in both Republican and Democratic administrations told lawmakers that it was, quote, my clear understanding security assistance money would not come until the president of Ukraine committed to pursue the investigation. That's a reference to potential investigations into Joe Biden and his son Hunter, as well as a conspiracy theory about alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. Taylor also testified that another witness, National Security Council official Tim Morrison, had told him that Trump, quote, did insist that President Zelensky go to a microphone and say he is opening investigations of Biden in 2016 and President Zelensky should want to do this himself, end quote. Taylor said ambassador to the European Union, this man, Gordon Sondland, also told him Trump was, quote, adamant about this. Taylor added the Trump administration's relations with Ukraine were, quote, driven by the irregular policy channel I had come to understand was guided by Rudy Giuliani. Today, House impeachment investigators heard new testimony from David Hale, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the third most senior official at the State Department. He's also the first witness to comply with Congress this week. Nine others refused to show up for their scheduled depositions, some in defiance of lawful subpoenas. Former National Security Advisor John Bolton has been asked to testify tomorrow. He is not expected to show up. Meanwhile, the White House is ramping up its effort to respond to the impeachment effort. Former Florida Attorney General and longtime Trump supporter Pam Bondi and former Treasury spokesman Tony Sayeg have been hired to help with messaging. And Trump's personal lawyer is lawyering up. Rudy Giuliani announced this afternoon that his new legal team is led by former federal prosecutor Robert Costello. 
He made headlines earlier this year after reports that he attempted to dangle a pardon to the president's former attorney, Michael Cohen. Meantime, Republicans seem to be searching for the best line of attack to defend the president. Republicans are really struggling to defend the president. OK, great. Not struggling on anything. OK, so Congressman. So the Republicans are not struggling on anything. I trust President Zelensky and President Trump. And I trust the fact that the Ukrainians didn't know that aid had been held and Ukrainians did nothing to get it released when it was released. What I can tell you about the Trump policy toward the Ukraine, it was incoherent. It depends on who you talk to. If there was a quid pro quo, it certainly wasn't a very effective one. There are perfectly appropriate quid pro quos. And there are inappropriate quid pro quos. They seem to be incapable of forming a quid pro quo. That doesn't rise to the level that they're trying to make it an impeachable offense. It's actually getting easier to defend the president. I'm not going to read these transcripts. The whole process is a joke. Now, while the Democrats and some former officials suggest it's timing, the, uh, it's time that the message on this controversy goes beyond the phrase quid pro quo. We keep on using this euphemistic expression, quid pro quo. The actual term for what occurred is extortion. And extortion is a crime. And the president extorted uh, the president of Ukraine for political dirt and a prospective political opponent and dangled military aid and the promise of a presidential visit. I think the allegation is extortion. It's pretty clear that all the arrows point in the direction that the president was leading the scheme. And the facts speak for themselves. If you give me what I want, you'll get the money. That to me is just a classic case of a criminal act. All right, here for our lead-off discussion on a Wednesday night, Shannon Pettypiece, a veteran journalist and senior White House reporter for NBC News Digital, Sam Stein, politics editor for The Daily Beast, and Mimi Roca, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, now a distinguished fellow in criminal justice at the Pace University School of Law. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you for helping us uh, kick it off tonight. Uh, Shannon, let me start with you. Senator John Kennedy here, we heard him saying uh, that there are appropriate types of quid pro quo and inappropriate types of quid pro quo. It's an interesting line of defense, except that if we forget about whether you're calling it quid pro quo or extortion or bribery or whatever, it's actually the thing in exchange that makes it inappropriate, not the idea that it happened. It's the, the fact that what Donald Trump wanted in exchange for this was support uh, that would help his campaign, that would help his reelection. Well, and I think you showed an excellent montage that captures the difficulty that the president's allies are having in finding a simple message that the public can understand that they can use to help get behind the president. Um, you mentioned also earlier the White House is trying to staff up as well to, again, get their message straight, get the story straight here. And we are six weeks into this process, I believe. The train has left the station. Uh, the White House is now just now adding staff. Um, Pam Bondi, the former Florida attorney general, and Tony Syag, who was uh, Steve Mnuchin's chief spokesperson um, and sort of led the communication or helped lead at least the communication strategy on tax reform, which the White House views as a success. But it's probably going to be several weeks before both of them are there and up and running. Um, so on the uh, congressional side, the Republicans in the Senate are talking about trying to fill in that void. But again, as you saw that message coming from Lindsey Graham, this idea that they're too confused, too um, incompetent to have pull off a quid pro quo, uh, that is probably not a line of defense that is going to be very effective <laughs> it, uh, going new, forward though. in the public sphere. So uh, they're maybe... still, yeah, they're searching for for this message. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's it's been weeks now. And yeah. this is probably going to be over with by the time they come up with one. So maybe we've talked about the various uh, lines of defense that have come up. There's the uh, he was Trump was fighting corruption. There's the he wanted Europe to put more money into it. There's the uh, yeah, was there, there was a quid pro quo, but it's not legal. The Lindsey Graham defense. This is new and interesting. Uh, they're, they're, the foreign policy of the Trump administration or Trump himself is too incoherent to have worked out a quid pro quo. As a former prosecutor, you don't have to be coherent to have figured out the I'll give you this if you give me in, in exchange for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what Graham's talking about, because, in fact, that demand, that bribe, that extortionate demand was communicated to Ukraine. Right. We know Sondland said it to one of the president's aides. We know that Volcker texted it. He said, 
you know, if you tell Trump you're going to in the phone call that you're going to give him the the deliverable, the investigation, then you'll get the meeting. I mean, the, the quid pro quo happened. The bribe right, happened. That's not, the, the facts don't even seem to be in dispute. Here. Exactly. The and that's what Adam disputed. Schiff said. And he's exactly right. And that's an important point, because I think the Republicans, on the one hand, they don't have a coherent message. On the other hand, they're trying to make it seem really confusing. Mm -hmm. So people kind of like they did with the Mueller investigation. Yeah, throw off their hands. It is not confusing. And the facts are established. They can argue what they want from the facts that, well, I mean, they seems to me they're sort of going down the road of, well, Trump didn't say quid pro quo. These other people who, by the way, are Trump people, mm -hmm. Trump appointees, Trump loyalists. You know, maybe they where they get this idea that they were supposed to make this demand of the Ukraine. I know where they got the idea from Rudy Giuliani, right. who Trump told everyone to talk to. So this idea that Trump knew nothing about this quid pro quo, plus he said it in his phone call. I mean, but they're trying to make it seem confusing. It's not. And Adam Schiff is exactly right to say the facts are largely uncontested here. Uh, Sam, we got about 400 pages almost of testimony uh, right. from Bill Taylor uh, today. And one of the things he did make clear is what Mimi just said, is that uh, the messaging came from Rudy Giuliani. He fully believed that Rudy Giuliani was acting on behalf of the president. Uh, but, but Rudy Giuliani remains central to this operation. How is that going to play out? Because Rudy Giuliani's got his own problems. He's, got a, he's now hired a, a new lawyer. He's generally been pretty silent, although today he tweeted... Uh, uh, that the investigation I conducted concerning 2016 Ukrainian collusion and corruption was done solely as a defense attorney to defend my client against false charges. That kept changing as one after another were disproven. Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump seem to be the two people we have to understand what they what they said to each other and how they did uh, what they did. Right. And it's sort of been a, a waiting game for many here in Washington, D.C. to see if Trump ends up throwing Rudy under the bus. I mean, there is this small area of distance between Rudy and the president, as you read through these transcripts, in which the president continues to deflect to Rudy, continues to advise people coming to him to speak directly to Rudy, as if to give him some sort of plausible deniability if and when this thing blew up and became public. Now, will he use that plausible deniability and say, listen, I didn't know what was going on. It was all Rudy. Uh, if there was a, a you nefarious know, quid pro quo, it's his fault. And if you have any you know, frustration or want to take anything out of him politically, do it, but leave me out of this. I'm curious if Trump ends up going the route. And honestly, I'm curious that he hasn't done it so far already. Maybe it's because Rudy simply knows too much. And Rudy himself has steadfastly insisted that he was operating at the behest of his client, the president of the United States, and did nothing wrong. But of course, um, you know, as you've now documented in just this short time period, there, the various levels of explanation are evolving constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we forget, but Mick Mulvaney literally got up in the White House briefing room and said that they did, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, have a quid pro quo policy in place and then had to, of course, walk it back a day later. So they're obviously they're hampered by the fact that they can't settle on one line of defense. Uh, but again, I am curious to see if Trump ever, ever does turn around and say, you know what, I got to cut Rudy loose on this. So to that point, Shannon, that they have trouble settling on uh, a, a singular line of defense. Uh, who are these two people who the White House has brought in? Uh, 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 Bondi and Syag. What, what's their relevance to this? So, I mean, we'll see what their roles actually end up shaking out to be. But there's the thinking that um, Pam Bondi, uh, she is a prosecutor. She has a legal background. Obviously, she was attorney general. Uh, she has a communications background. And she's she's pretty good at public speaking, going on television. She could play the role of the sort of James Carville-like figure who could go out and be Trump's attack dog and, and also help coordinate the message and have a bit of a, a broader legal understanding and a political understanding about how to frame this. So that's one possible thinking about what her role could be there. Um, Tony Syag is someone who was with the Treasury Department. He is very close to uh, Steve Mnuchin. Uh, he was sort of put on detail to the White House during tax reform to help them coordinate their messaging there. And within the White House, tax reform and getting that passed is seen as one of their their big victories, one of the moments where they were all on message and they were able to 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 herd Congress together for sort of one uh, purpose. 
Uh, he is very well liked by Jared and Ivanka, who pushed for his hiring. So the potential could be for him to come in and, and coordinate the communication staff and the messaging across the Hill, um, among TV surrogates, across uh, different agencies who are coming on. Uh, so that's one of the thinking there, too. But the White House still lacks someone big picture, who reports directly to the president, mm -hmm. who has the broad view across mm -hmm. agencies, because, of course, OMB is involved, the Energy Department is involved, uh, who has relationships uh, at a high level with members uh, on the Hill, who can communicate with them. They still lack, uh, essentially, a quarterback to manage this. And that's why I think it sounds like we're starting to hear people say, um, the congressional senator, uh, the Senate Republicans are going to try and step in and fill that void on a communications front and sort of circle the wagons around the president because they don't see this happening at the White House. And even with these new hires coming on, that will probably take a few weeks for them to get in place and to actually start uh, reorganizing things and putting together a message. But it will be interesting, Mimi, if uh, if, if Pam Bondi or Tony Sayag start to uh, be the face of this thing, because Rudy Giuliani was for a long time, and that's been uh, not the most successful strategy. Let's just listen to a little <laughs> of, what, of what Rudy Giuliani has said on this particular issue. Why am I doing it, Laura? Can't you figure it out? I'm his defense lawyer. I was seeking, in the best tradition of being a lawyer, a defense lawyer, to vindicate my client. Tell it's me. in the best interest of my client to unravel the corruption in the Ukraine. Evaluate that, please, Mimi. So, you know, Giuliani <laughs> is, is trying to defend himself and his actions by saying, I was doing this in the interest of my client. I'm just acting as any good defense lawyer would. And the problem for him and for Trump is that, first of all, he has admitted numerous times on TV, on Twitter tonight, that he was acting, that this entire policy was in the interest of Donald Trump, not the United States of America. Right. He keeps saying, that my is, client, Donald Trump. Yeah, and, and, you know, that is, and it, it rings true because nothing they were doing with respect to Ukraine was in the interest of protecting Ukraine and therefore, you know, our allies yeah, protecting for, them. If you recall for a hot second, he said he was doing this for the State Department and then that that suddenly went away. Exactly. So, you know, the, the, and that so it, it feeds right into this idea that you are of, of what Trump is, what's at the heart of the impeachment, that Trump is should be impeached because they're using this power of the presidency to do something for his oh. personal benefit here, the campaign or even if it's just because he wants to prove that crazy, you know, Ukraine conspiracy theory right, because he's obsessed with it, he being Giuliani and Trump. But the reason it's not going to work, I think, even if Trump does, and he may, try to throw Giuliani under the bus is a couple of things. First of all, the phone call, right? We have the phone call where Trump is using the same, he's echoing the same words that we know Giuliani is saying about, you know, getting the investigation right. and looking into the Bidens. In, in, he doesn't say anything about corruption. So That's it, a key point. Yeah. In no point in that conversation, according to the transcript or the memo of it released by the White House, is the term uh, corruption used, nor in the full transcript. Exactly. And also, and this is a big point, too, I mean, first of all, right, we forget that Trump stood on the front lawn and said, you know, Ukraine and China and everybody should do this. But also, Rudy Giuliani could not freeze the aid. Only the White House. Right. Well, not only the White House, but the White House did it. Trump right. did it. And that's an important point. And so I, I do think that he may try to, you know, put this all on rogue Rudy Giuliani. But I think right. the Democrats should keep coming. Three hundred ninety one million dollars. Rudy Giuliani could not control exactly. that. Sam Stein, the uh, the first full day of public testimony will happen on November the 13th, a week from today. The president has announced uh, that Turkish president President Erdogan will visit the United States and the White House on that day. What do you make of that? Well, it could be coincidental, but at the same time, we know that Trump loves counter-programming. I mean, you let off the show with the news that he wanted Bill Barr, as attorney general, to do a press conference uh, to exonerate him, essentially, say he'd done nothing wrong. If you go back uh, to the origins of the uh, Russia probe, it was, you know, a push to get uh, then attorney general uh, Jeff Sessions to make some public dec declaration along the same lines. And Trump operates through this prism in which well, the only things that matter are TV moments. And so that's why these public testimonies are so important. They will, for the first time, obviously, bring into people's homes witnesses 
uh, and who were privy to uh, what was a back channel policy led by Rudy Giuliani to upend Ukraine policy. Now, I am curious how Trump reacts to that, whether it's having Erdogan in, whether it's holding rallies, whether it's doing his own press conferences to counter program. We know that he looks at things and wonders, how can I win news cycles? And the fact that this is going into the public hearing test, uh, part of the uh, impeachment hearing uh, suggests that Trump is going to have to sort of reconfigure his own strategy going forward. Thank you to the three of you for joining me tonight. Shannon Petty P. Sam Thanks, Stein, Alan. and Mimi Roca. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.